there's such a push now from the Democrats to have uh, mail-in voting. They'd, they'd like, of course, to create that as the primary voting in November. Hopefully that won't go anywhere. Maryland is one of the states that does not ban ballot harvesting. You guys are looking at that to put legislation in that would not allow third parties to go around and, and collect ballots and take them in in truckloads like happened in California. I was on a call earlier this week. Carl Rove was uh, the speaker on the call. It was the Republican State Legislative Committee. It's a national committee of um, leaders from the House and the Senate of the 50 states. And Carl was, the, uh, he's amazing. He was a great speaker. And he talked about that very thing. And obviously many states that haven't had their primary are using a mail-in for this primary election. And we are concerned about that. Um, and I, I, like you, hope that we'll be back to regular voting in November. Uh, I, 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 I guess I'm optimistic. I think we should be back to regular things in November. We'll see how that happens. But people want to vote in person and, and certainly we won't be able to put any legislation in until next year. I, I don't think we're going to have a special session. Leg legislative leadership already said uh, no special session this month. I don't anticipate we'll be back until January. Um, I don't think taxpayers want to see legislators using tax money, you know, to override these or anything like that. So we left a pretty uh, substantial amount of money in the rainy day fund. And I think Governor Hogan uh, should be able to leverage the money that we need to pay for the pandemic. And hopefully we'll be back and voting in person in November. A question from Christopher Tomlinson. Can you explain what the timeline looks like for Governor Hogan to veto the Kerwin bill and the General Assembly potentially overriding the veto? Early May, we'll know all of his vetoes. I feel like the governor will veto the Kerwin bill. Um, he wasn't thrilled with it while we were in session, and this cost is so high. Uh, I also don't think the Kerwin addresses some of this uh, digital learning from home, some of the things that we should be doing are not in Kerwin, so I think they're just going to have to scrap it and come back or revamp it next year. So we'll know early May if the governor vetoes. The only reason to call a special session would be to override the veto to put it into effect right away. I don't think that there's an appetite to do that. So the um, veto overrides have to happen when we come back in session. So if we come back for a special session, they'll have to look at all the vetoes. Or when we come back in January, the first order of business is veto addressing vetoes, whether they're overridden or whether they're allowed to be sustained. From Arnette um, Davis Dunn, and she asked, could you please provide the name and number of the two tax bills that we should write to Governor Hogan about? Oh, great. Great idea, yes. Yeah, so um, House Bill 932 and House Bill 732. Those are the two bills, the digital download and streaming tax. House Bill 932 is the digital download and streaming tax. House Bill 732 is the cigarette tax and digital advertising. And then the Kerwin bill, you don't need a number, just say Kerwin. Uh, everybody, I, I didn't write it down, but uh, the Kerwin bill, you know, is pretty self-explanatory. I think it's HB 1300. Do that, but just Google, contact Governor Hogan. You can only get him by email through a form. You have to go to a form, choose the topic, choose taxes. So quick note, Governor Hogan, please veto um, House Bill 932 and House Bill 732, the two tax bills as well as the Kerwin bill. Thank you and put your name in, it'd be that simple. That. Uh, Veronica on Facebook, she said in 2016, she had a friend in Timonium that went to vote and she was told that she had already voted, which obviously is fraud. She complained to her congressman about it and never heard anything back. What's going to change or is this gonna be allow more fraud with paper ballots? Fortunately, that's not a regular occurrence, but I have heard of that happening before. I'm sorry if that happens again. 
uh, contact the state party, contact me. You know, the chairman of the the Maryland Republican Party is Dirk Hare. He's doing a fantastic job. And um, he, the, the party is equipped to follow up kind of broad. Um, she should have requested a provisional ballot, ballot and voted and let them hold that and test it and, you know, because that's wrong. Um, we do we do have some voter fraud. I love it when Democrats say there's no voter fraud. Well, I, I always point to Wendy Rosen, for those of you that remember when Congressman Andy Harris ran in, in 2012, his Democrat opponent was found to have voted in Florida and Maryland on two different elections. Same same cycle. So, you know, it does happen and, and the congressional candidate herself was found guilty of doing that. So um, that is a problem when you, you worry about um, extensive early voting or absentee ballot voting when you go show up at your polling place if somebody else somehow used your identity. Um, it's just obviously very wrong. Thanks, Kathy. Even without Carolyn, we know there's going to be a deficit. Would you talk about the structural deficit that is looming? Um, I did send a uh, image of the general fund recent history and outlook from the Appropriations Committee. And Ellen, I don't know when you were in the legislature if you ever saw this, but we actually had a negative structural deficit of $19 million, which meant we were $19 million ahead <laughs> instead of behind. So that was the 2020 budget. And I believe we came out ahead because Governor Hogan did not spend some of the fenced off money that the Democrats, the Democrats had put some money in certain categories and said, you can only spend it on this or this. And Governor Hogan just didn't spend it. So uh, we ended up with a quote, extra $19 million above, above what our budget had been. Um, so a structural deficit for 2021 without this pandemic would have been $67 million. Uh, the rainy day fund was $1.3 billion. Barring the pandemic, we're in pretty good fiscal shape. I think Governor Hogan over the last six budgets has done a good job of reining in spending while 84% of the budget is mandated spending. He's done a good job when he presents his budget and, and reining in some of the spending. You know, I am concerned like you about this pandemic and the effect it's going to have on our state budget. Um, the governor's put a hiring freeze on everybody. Nobody's been furloughed yet. None of that has happened. Unlike any other state in the um, United States where the governor presents the budget to the legislature and then the legislature can only cut. They can't, you know, take money from here to increase this. They can cut money from the budget. They do a little bit of fund swapping, but for the most part, you know, that's the way our constitution is written. In the early 1900s, the state legislature had um, just about bankrupted the state of Maryland, and they made that change, and they said the governor will present the budget to the legislature, and they will only um, be able to cut it. Concerned, we do have a spending affordability committee. I'm sure they'll be meeting, looking at forecasts. The Appropriations Committee had already had a meeting last week. Um, they did it by Zoom, so they, they are looking at those numbers going forward, and uh, we're all concerned. We're, some economists are predicting a V-shaped recovery where when people start getting back to work, you know, there'll be some pent up, uh, you know, need and spending from, from people and we won't have as big a recession, we won't have a recession and the recovery will not take as long. We do have a comment from Arnette Davis and she said, good evening, Kathy. I would like to personally thank you for your time and all of your efforts on behalf of the citizens of Maryland. Oh, thank you. Very nice. I appreciate it. Thank all of you for your activism. It's always such a pleasure to, you know, meet with the Republican women of Baltimore County. You guys are so active and on top of what's going on. It's great to have folks we can count on. Um, the, the last week, the House Republican Caucus had a great 
a conference call with Governor Hogan's, uh, some people on Governor Hogan's administration in his administration. And then Friday evening, Leader Nick Kipke and I were able to speak with the governor about um, the current state of affairs here in Maryland. We sent the governor a memo from our caucus um, and thanking him for his work in this pandemic and you know saving so many lives, keeping us all safe. And we ask that he look at the state of Maryland in a regional way as they start looking towards easing restrictions. You know, certainly our Western Maryland three counties, I think they've had two deaths in those three counties. And Southern Maryland looks similar. You know, they've had more, but I think they've had 100 hospitalizations in Southern Maryland. Eastern Shore, um, you know, also not as greatly impacted. So we asked if the governor, when he looks at easing, if he could look at things regionally, we asked him to look at easing restrictions on things like uh, recreational boating, golfing, horseback riding. You know, now that the weather is getting better, people are gonna to wanna to be able to get outside. And if they can do it safely and adhere to all the CDC guidelines, um, you know, we're hoping that he'll take a look at that. Um, the census forms are, coming out. Understand it, it'll be the 2022 legislative session that the census results will be in and uh, redistricting and reapportionment will be uh, before the legislature. And I think so many within so many days, if the legislature overrides it, then it'll come up with its own plan, which can be terrible again. Yeah. And I, I'm just wondering if there is a strategy underway to get in a position where where they they would be shamed <laughs> so much that they would not at least be as terrible as it is now. Yes. So um, the census is going on now. It's going to be delayed because of the pandemic. Rob McCord is the Secretary of Planning. He's the census data and and carrying that out in Maryland. So um, across the country, and I think President Trump has talked about it, will be delayed. The state of Maryland files the data of the census, gets it, you know, the federal government takes it, does all their work with it, and you know, Maryland gets that, I guess, approved data back. I'm not, Rob McCord could give you the exact details on that. Nevertheless, the data will not be back to us until probably June of next year. Every district, the congressional and the state legislative, all of the council districts, they're all respond using that data. We'll have to have a special session probably in the fall, I'm guessing October or November, for legislative redistricts because our primary is in June. So, you know, we need to get the maps drawn and bill passed so we know what the districts look like because you have to live in the district for six months. The governor takes a map, submits it to the legislature. If they don't pass something else, this map is enacted. It, they, they can put together their own map and pass it, and then the governor could veto it, they, you know, they could override it. I've been working on this. This is a project that some of the members of the House Republican Caucus have been working on because we know it's a year from October. So that'll be here before we know it, but we can't do any actual map drawing until we get the census back. How will election judges be used? So um, th listen, our local boards of elections have their work cut out for them. So the, the June 2nd election, they anticipate, you know, 3 million votes can be cast. And um, they, your map ballot in Baltimore County or whichever county you're in will be, you will mail it back to your local county board of election. They will set up, if any of you have ever been to an absentee ballot opening, um, you will all get to see it now because it'll be streamed mm -hmm. on Facebook. So you oh. It'll be transparent. I spoke with the Board of Elections today. They will have uh, video access for the public to see the ballots being received. They they check them, they open them. Your, your ballot goes inside an envelope, so they check it. They make sure that it, you know it's legal, it, it's not a fake ballot. And then they put it in a certain pile and then they'll open it. You'll have a Republican watching and a Democrat watching. 
I'm hoping in second, some of these restrictions will be eased and we'll actually be allowed to have real people in there watching, not, you know, gaggles of people probably. But, you know, hopefully we'll be able to have a, you know, a Republican, at least one Republican and one Democrat challenger in, in the room watching the process. The electronic voting, you know, records that they have, um, they really, our local boards of elections work very hard and do a really good job. It was uh, very nice to have you. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. This is great. Um, God bless you all. Thank you so much.